2 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Atlantic Standard, and we can we can get started. Very good. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Tukan from Leadshift here, and I have a couple of my friends here: Derek Ron, the CRO of Lead Genius, and Neil Pazero, uh, the founder of the Deep Company, ex Chief Business Officer at Big Willow. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So. Thank you very much for coming. Um, today's topic is something that I am extremely passionate about. Um, and specifically, it's about data. And not only just data, but more specifically, how is data leveraged by B2B enterprise companies when they're planning out their go-to-market motion? So uh, super excited to have these two people who have been dealing with data and and everything associated with data and other B2B enterprise companies. So again, thank you very much. Um, before we, we get in, um, some admin and housekeeping items for the people that have joined in um, live. Um, at any point, if there's a question that you guys wanna ask, feel free to put it in the, in the chat window. I will try to ask Neil uh, and or Derek. Uh, and at the end of it, we'll leave a few, few minutes uh, for a Q and A. So, with with that, um, let's get started. I think it'll be great is if if you guys give a brief intro background about yourself. Uh, I'll start with you, Derek. Yeah, you know, my name is Derek Ron. I'm the CRO uh, at Lead Genius. I've actually been at the organization um, since its Series A, and um, you know, I've have kind of worn a lot of hats inside the organization. My my real passion is is you know it actually in the data space, solving people's go to market challenges and filling in the the gaps in their data strategy. So, uh, you know, I, I live in on a day to day basis, uh, not only with our customers but with with you know our own go to market strategy and and the way that we, um, you know, think about attracting new customers and prospecting and and actually building pipeline. Awesome, thank you, Neil. Great, thanks, Tukan. This is Neil Passero. I'm the founder of The Deep Company, and I've been in Silicon Valley for the past 30 years, worked as a consultant and advisor and as a business builder, servicing primarily sales and marketing in the B2B enterprise space. Uh, I was part of the Serious Decisions team, as well as built a few companies that have been folded up in the data space, as well as the uh, analytics space here in the Valley. Awesome, cool. So. So let's let's dive a little bit into this data data topic or, or today's topic. Um, anytime someone talks about data, it is it's a pretty broad topic. It's like content. What does it mean? There are multiple facets to that. So so with that being said, the first question that I had for you guys was when thinking of go to market motions within B two B enterprise companies, what different types of data have you guys seen being used by by the teams within these go-to-market teams within the enterprise. So I'll, I'll start with Derek. Yeah, I mean, uh, any available data that's, a, that's, that's there, right? I mean, you know, here's the thing is, we are living in a data era, in a, in a digital and, and data, you know, data relevant era. You know, <laughs> the old saying is, right, um, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that that's, you know, the reality is Absolutely. Um, the accessibility of data, the importance of data, especially from a go to market team perspective and whether that's a hunter going out and trying to build personas, find unique messaging, find relevant content, find relevant personalization, um, find a value add, something that's going on topically inside of the, the, the industry or find a trigger event that they can use to open a door, you know, literally if it's unique if it's relevant if it adds credibility or value to the conversation hmm. it's like the more the better you know so so again like you know th there's there's a ton there there's you know obviously there's firmographic there's technographic there's um persona based data right and then there's and then there's the relevant context data and then there's also all this data about usage right there's for for farmers inside the organization there's there's great tools like pendo and all these analytic tools that tell you who's interacting with what and and what who's not using what services so i mean again it's it's a really really broad question we could spend 30 minutes just talking about different types of data and how to use it i think that you know the biggest thing to think about is relevance 
um, messaging? How does this inform the conversation? How does it get it to a value add quicker for a sales rep or an SDR or a frontline person? Or from a marketing standpoint, how does it allow you to create these personas and this categorization that creates content and, and talk tracks and and a really a value add to those per, to those people that's relevant? Because you know it's there's a it's a mess out there right now there you know COVID has impacted a lot of businesses everyone you see my inbox I get more messages uh from cold prospects than ever before and the only people that are getting through are the ones that are really really using data in a, in a wise way and you can tell that's coming from a centralized strategy or a real practitioner at, at the kind of the top end so uh I'll, I'll I'll let Neil talk a little bit about this but I mean yeah, like as much information as you can incorporate in a relevant way to your value add to, to the conversation to the buyer, uh, the, the better off you're going to be in terms of your effectiveness and, and building pipeline. Awesome. Neil. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. I, I love how you covered uh, the, the demographic data, the person data, the, the technographic data, uh, the account data, those two relate, right? What types of things are installed at a company? What companies are we talking about? You touched on the activity data. Uh, intent data is near and dear to my heart, having pioneered and built up that category uh, in the early part of the, uh, the teens uh, through uh, this last decade. And uh, you know, the way I work with, with clients is to put that on a grid, right? You take the, the types of data, demographic, account data, uh, firmographic data, technographic data, the activity data, then you can look at it by first party, right? What do we, what did, what did we build? What will we build? The second party data, what can we borrow? Uh, what can we get from a partner, someone who's close to us, maybe that we're sharing data? That's a really interesting area where companies are uh, working together to pool mm -hmm. data to, to help the, the group. That's an increasingly interesting space uh, where, where you see this burgeoning in these sort of blockchain oriented uh, activities on the very cutting edge. Finally, there's the, the third party data stuff that you buy. So you've got build, borrow and buy. If you make a matrix of build, borrow, buy against the, the demographic, firmographic, technographic intent data, you have a really interesting model to start to use to block out hmm. what you do and don't have where you do and don't want to put energy or budgets and maybe what really the ideal state is that you want to map your organization over time to build towards. So that's how I would think about uh, what data are we, are we using? That's awesome. Well, a fo few follow-up questions to that then. Um, and, and Derek, you mentioned it, it depends on, you know, relevant data that can be accessed by the hunters or the farmers. This is more from a sales perspective, provided they're stored in a centralized location. Where is it typically this, and going by Neil's example of having these different types of data from different sources, where is it typically hosted? Like, where is it stored? Yeah, and, and I think that's like one of the challenges of, of, of our modern ecosystem, right? Is that, you know, the marketing automation space went through this kind of, you know, evolution 10 years ago, and we're seeing it now inside the sales enablement space, et cetera. And, you know, you've got these two different teams, marketers have budget, salespeople typically don't. And it's like, how do we get the information that might be stored in a Marketo or in a HubSpot or you know, come through some type of a stream and, and, or maybe it comes to a partner channel, right? Like, like Neil was talking about, and there's great tools about how do you access that data through Crossbeam or some of these other tools to get that information in front of the, the party, right? But that's actually, you know, that's the reason we've seen this explosion of revenue operation titles. That's the reason why we've seen sales operation titles, you know, go from really, really avant-garde cutting edge companies are the only ones who employ them to like, hey, if you got seven people on your team, you need a, a sales ops person right like to to that level of need um because it, it's all about utility right you could you could do the exercise that neil's talking about and have like a fantastic strategy have this lovely matrix of all this data and like oh man how cool is this and then you're not putting it in front of the people that need to use it and need to make informed decisions and it's and you've just wasted a ton of money like literally just lit a pile of cash on fire. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that to me, 
you know, that's some of the problems that we're trying to solve as a business, as well as this data orchestration piece and getting the information in front of the people who need to use it. And so, you know, for marketers, it's, it's, you know, it's a marketing automation system, but sales reps don't get access to a marketing automation system. So that doesn't help them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's about, you know, either your CRM admin, your Salesforce admin, you know, being able to put the objects that they need into the visible places and then useful tools like creating list views for, for reps. So they know, Hey, this is how I start my day and this is how I work through my process. Right. And not making them go out and say, Oh, I, I wonder if we got that new list. Let me check my email. Like the more systems of record you're making these people go into yeah. the, the lower the utility is. And yeah. that's, I think that's really the key. And that's where you see, um, the companies that are really separating themselves in the marketplace. A lot of these companies that have had great acceleration, it's not only that they're doing the things that Neil talks about, which is looking at the data landscape and saying what's pertinent, but it's also like, great, how do we create a pertinent playbook to the rep where that information is backed up with, with a call script with that, with uh, the collateral, with the supporting documents, with a webinar, with a real strategy right around that and 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 usability from a day-to-day -day process standpoint fair enough neil one question for you related to the data piece you talked about intent data being being used um, across these enterprise companies for their go-to market where are they storing this data like where is, where does it reside intent well, intent follows that same model of build, right? That might be uh, data that's uh, from web activity on my sure. own website. Uh, borrow, uh, a really interesting use that we put together uh, a little while back with Akamai uh, okay. and my good friend Lucy Gillard. Uh, they actually worked with their partners to tag their partner site with a pixel that we managed at the Big Willow uh, and we were able to look at people during, uh, specifically, it was one of the, uh, one of the uh, virus outbreaks, the WannaCry. We tagged the Akamai site and Akamai partner sites, and we saw accounts coming to partner sites first and then landing on the Akamai site within a very short window. So there's a good example of, of build on my own site, first party, uh, borrow from partners secondarily. And that would be data that would uh, exist in, in this case, in the Big Willow data set that was made available through CRM uh, to the customers. And then finally, uh, there's the external data, the third party stuff you might buy from a Bombora or a Tech Target or G2 Crowd or Aberdeen, who, who were the company that, that acquired the Big Willow. Got it. Got it. You, you forgot lead shift. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. No, it's okay. Uh, cool. So now, now that we know where it's residing, what different kinds of data, what are the different, you know, buyer personas or teams within these large enterprises that, that are sort of involved with gathering the data or collecting the data and then operationalizing it. Derek talked about the revenue ops people, sales ops. What are some teams that you have seen, Neil, be involved within the go-to market motion when they're thinking of, okay, we need to come up with a go-to market strategy. These are the people that will be at the table when they're coming up with this data driven strategy. Yeah. You know, I love that Derek brought up and, and Tukan, you mentioned to the sales team, especially the SDRs who are going to actually use this stuff. Uh, having sat in an SDR seat, you know, in my own career and knowing the pain and suffering that, that one goes through just to get a good phone number, that one can use to connect with an individual, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is so meaningful. Um, so, uh, you know, they are always front and center in my mind. What are they gonna get? How is it action? Darren, talk, Darren talked about all the great aspects of the playbooks and messaging that you can tee up in systems. Those systems are amazing. And you can really see that shift in the investment world and in the buyer activity right now in, in technology arming our SDR teams with all these incredible tools that are out there that, that bring data together and make it easy for us to do stuff, uh, run plays with, with the data. So I think that's really, really the most exciting space that there is and where, where clearly there's a lot of uh, room to uh, innovate further, but where there's lots of room for each company to employ the tools that are available that house the data and make it actionable. Um, you know, th there's the obvious groups, uh, you know, the demand gen team, the marketing ops team, 
uh, demand gen team is actioning that data somehow or another in digital channels and email and advertising platforms. The, the ops team is keeping it clean, keeping it organized, keeping it aligned to the strategy. Uh, that's pretty obvious. The, the one thing that, that I don't think we get enough attention and, and we're a, an audience that could pay a lot more attention is the executive team really, you know, helping uh, executives understand why data is so strategically important. And, you know, in my opinion, every company uh, can be a data company. The question is whether you are working towards that as DNA for your organization. If you're really strong in the data capabilities uh, with your own products, especially as well as in your marketing and sales efforts, you're in a really, really powerful position these days to, to uh, create demand and create opportunities faster than the competition. So I think that's where executives kind of fit into the equation. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's always great new roles, the rev ops and, and, and the like that are up and coming too, and, and they all matter. But you know, basically we're talking about sales operations, uh, sales enablement, uh, demand gen, marketing ops, um, you know, and, and, and we'll have our new titles that are, that are coming up that address that, that, that are those persona to yeah. kind of that, you, that you asked about. Derek, any, any new titles or any buyer personas that you have seen to add to that? I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I've seen titles like uh, Data Czar, right, inside of these organizations now, um, you know, and, and it, you know, it's, it's really kind of limitless. I, I, I think about it in the same way that I think about um, kind of the evolution that's happened inside of sports, right, and, and some of the things that have happened inside of, like, baseball with Billy Bean and, and the advanced metrics and the advanced analytics that are happening inside of, of basketball as, as another good example. Right. And at first, you know, you saw these kind of like these innovators, the, these early adopters of this, the people that were kind of pushing the line, um, you know, they, they came from wall street. They came from these like very, very, very data centric or very kind of like um, business minded places. And they, they, they took those kind of lessons, right. They took the Wharton school of business kind of playbook about advanced analytics and they started to apply it to sports and they looked at utility and they looked at these kind of these niche pieces and they built teams around and they've built championships around it. Right. So, uh, or very, at least very successful teams that are co consistently competing at a lower cost of ownership. Um, and so I think that that same thing is, is now really happening widely inside of B2B companies. And yeah, I mean, a lot of it started in B2B SaaS, but I, I do know of like traditional businesses, traditional businesses that like Granger or companies that were not thought of as data companies who are now saying, we're either going to be a data company or we're not going to exist right? Like we're either going to like have a data strategy. It's going to be top down. It's going to be through the executive level down and everyone's going to buy in or we're going to perish. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's the evolution of technology. That's the evolution of, of business. And that's where companies are going and it's becoming their uh, competitive differentiator is like potentially being, you know, being a John Deere and having a data team, right? Like that's like your attractor company. It's like, yeah, but if we're not a data centric organization we're not going to be able to sell tractors because we're yeah. not going to be able to meet our customers where they're going to need to be we're not going to be able to predict be able to predict demand we're not going to be able to to build our supply chains correctly it's all of those things coming into the fold right and you know what i've seen or what i, I think we will continue to see or what i hope that we continue to see is this like panel of executives who are thinking about this in the way that Neil talked about, where it's top down and getting everyone on the same page, right? Because part of the disparity inside these organizations has been, okay, great, you know, we have a sales team and we've got a marketing team and we've got, you know, they've got demand gen functions inside of them. And then there's customer success, which is like kind of involved and kind of like over here on the side and they all living in their own little silos with their own little metrics and their own little safe worlds. And everyone's, you know, operating off a different measure of success. And so when you see titles like chief revenue officer, it's because they understand that there needs to be one throat to choke and that that person needs to push a policy and uh, conformity 
across all those teams and make sure that everyone is sharing data and that they all have the same kind of metrics of success. Because an MQL doesn't mean anything if there's not revenue on the back end of it, right? And so these traditional terms are being thrown by the wayside because they're self-defeating to have people operate in these silos, which again is is what I think we continue to see as, as business is evolving and that you know people are really starting to think about this as what is my strategy and how do I use that data across all my teams? Yeah. And that's something that also hasn't existed. Like we, we have sales teams that have great data they could be passing on their customer success mm-hmm. and it never gets there because there's no incentive for them yeah. to do that. Yeah. The, from their metrics, from the way they're scored and judged as individual contributors, there's no benefit to them that they can see of passing that data along. Yeah. They're not thinking oh, wow, well, if I keep the customer happy, my paycheck's going to be bigger because they're yeah. going to continue to employ me. So we need to, you know, you have to have the, those, those top-down models yeah. where you're, you're utilizing all of the data that is available to you. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. So moving on to this idea of data and how it's being used, let's talk about a few specific use cases that we think when someone is thinking from a go-to-market motion. And one of the first things, that comes into mind is let's say they have a new campaign coming up where they're, you know, taking a product or a feature or something to market. And the first part of it is account selection is how do you figure out who do you go after? And, and, and to that end, uh, love to hear some examples or uh, insights that you guys can share from how you have done work with your clients is how has data been used by these enterprises to better target the right accounts? Not better target, better identify the right accounts to target. Um, I guess, Neil, you can, if you, if you want to start. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, a great story that still has legs is the 2015 Serious Decisions ROI Award that was awarded to the team at Commvault, uh, Don Colosi, uh, and, and team. Uh, they won in the content strategy uh, category, incidentally, but they used intent data to address a huge problem that they faced in the marketing organization. And that was marketing was sort of marooned out on an island with no budget, and in fact, increasing budget cuts that were putting increasing pressure on their ability to execute. Uh, and, and these guys were heroic and, and quite brave. They took it upon themselves to do what I call a, a ground up strategy where they said, hey, we know what we need to do. We're going to be bold and we are going to do something. And what they did is they just pared down everything that they uh, were spending on and they invested heavily on identifying who was on their website, of course, the first party intent data, right? Invested heavily on those in the early inklings of those tools where the IP identification systems were coming up, et cetera, and invested heavily with the Big Willow team uh, with intent data, as well as other vendors as well. And what they did was really, really intelligent. They identified through sort of a spider web of content that they built out who was actively interested in what they sell. And they very heavily then targeted on those companies uh, and, and, uh, went after them. Uh, so they were able to do account selection based on activity data, uh, on their first party and the third party. And that enabled them with very small budgets to make a huge impact to the point where the head of sales was even like, wow, this is really helping us. And, you know, you, we've all been around the block. How often does the head of sales say like, wow, do more of that, please. I'm really interested. How did you do that? What's going on here? How come you're getting us in front of these people that are having such a big impact? So much so that the the CEO of Commvault made a statement on a Wall Street earnings call about marketing. I mean, that never happens. So I think this is a really good example of people being really crafty. uh, And and these are the days of, of, in my opinion, uh, opportunity for marketers inside of companies to be really, really creative. Uh, there's a whole slew of things you can buy, but that editorial curatorial function of, of putting things together to solve what your company is trying to do now and address the go-to-market strategy that your company is trying to do, is really, really fun, big opportunities for people. 
So, uh, I, you know, that's a real fun story that I love and I think still holds water uh, after all these years as people are now really taking on intent data, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of more of the, the late or late early adopter phase uh, uh, mainstream that it's getting into. That's a great example. Actually, I'm going to come back to you, Neil, of, of, on the activation piece uh, sure. for that. Uh, Derek, a uh, question for you is, can you give an example of how uh, that you've worked with a client at Lead Genius, provided it with data or how they have leveraged data to target, to identify the accounts that they should be going after? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is a common uh, planning, yeah. uh, you know, kind of a cycle phase piece for us as a business yeah. because, um, you know, your list is the strategy, right? The strategy is the list, yeah, right, and. I, especially in a day where, um, you know, you really have to conduct yourself with a focus and with an attention to detail and with, with like knowing your buyer and knowing where you can win, right. Knowing where you actually have product market fit and actually can solve a problem and have interest, right. That has to start at the, at stage one in planning. And so, you know, you get, we get earlier companies, we get, you know, companies that are kind of, you know, series A, series B that are, you know, well-funded and they're like, Hey, we want to accelerate and get fast to a market. That's great. Um, but it's always, I mean, the most beneficial thing to do is be able to say like, Hey, where have you won in the past? Right? Like let's do the regression analysis of, of where you're winning now. Right. And then let's look at the characteristics of those companies, looking at these different data points, like, like Neil's talked about to say, what are the commonalities? What are the trends? What are, what, what, are, what are these businesses have in common and, and what is, what is resonating with them from a messaging standpoint? And so it's about taking that universe of your total addressable market and re and measuring it down to what's reachable, right? What's reachable right now? What's really, what can we really, where can we win and where can we win with high level of effectiveness and, you know, being able to create tiers. Hey, here's my tier A accounts. These are ones where we absolutely have uh, not only the right to win, but we have a unique differentiator and value add and, and they're, they're high valued accounts. They're faster sales velocity. They're, you know, they're bigger deals, whatever it is, right? There's a lot of ways to kind of measure that, but starting there with, taking the, the, the overall universe and pairing it down into different tiers of accounts and then creating the strategies at those different tiers so that you've got your immediate goes in the hands of the sales rep where the demand gen and the marketer and the sales team are all on the same page fighting to win inside those accounts to tier B where they're getting more of the digital marketing and more of kind of the, the brand recognition piece to the long tailed stuff, right? The stuff that's you know, maybe a couple of years out in terms of when you're actually going to win that deal or when you might have the functionality or the product market fit for that, but you still need to, to be building some awareness inside those markets. So I think that we do that constantly. We do that. We've done that with uh, companies as, you know, small upcoming companies like Route or like Snowflake in their, in their early days of using us where it's like, hey, where are we winning and how do we win more of those deals? We've done those with big advanced companies like Google. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, kind of how do you eat an elephant, right? Like one bite at a time and where do we start? Like what's, what's the actual part that, that's a starting point where we can see the most traction today? Because again, for us as a data vendor, you know, they need to see ROI. And so it's like, hey, let's start with the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah. And, you know, whether that like an example of a low hanging fruit campaign is like, hey, who's bought from you in the past and where are they now? Let's go ahead and do advocate tracking or let's go ahead and find these change agents, these people yeah. that are familiar with your solution that are gone to a new business that doesn't have it. Let's yeah. identify those people. Let's track and monitor those people so that every single time that they move into a new opportunity, that's the lowest hanging fruit you could possibly have is these 100%. people that already know your value proposition, right? So Absolutely. oftentimes it's starting with something as simple as that. Um, and then, and then expanding out, right? And then the, the, the strategy is then like, okay, great. What do we do for the Bs? What do we do for the Cs, right? Okay. So all of these different pieces uh, have a role, but I think that starting with, you know, the lowest hanging fruit is, is really the key to, to proving a model and then, and then, you know, scaling it. Awesome. So going back to Neil's example of Comvault, uh, where, he, where they were using, they were creating content and then they basically looked at people that are coming to their first party site engaging with that content, figuring out who those companies were, and also looking on third-party web, people that were engaging with those kind of content on the third-party web, identify those accounts. 
And then comes the whole idea of, okay, now how do I reach out to them? Well, activate or whatever. How did, in this case, Commvault or uh, activate that, uh, that data, that, that insight, that target account list that they were building? Yeah, great question, Tukan. Um, you know, activation happens through channels. Um, you know, what, what are the channels? Uh, we've got our, our advertising channels, whether they be programmatic display or a vendor that has some sort of dis display program, right? We've got, we've got email, uh, we've got phone, uh, and we've got live interactions. You know, I, I kind of put that as maybe events, big or small, uh, or even face-to-face -face conversations that, that are created in meetings um, or, or other mechanisms. So you're going to activate that data to achieve some sort of, you know, movement conversion in one of those channels. Um, uh, another client that did some really amazing work um, was uh, the team, uh, the, uh, the, the, the corporate insights team at SAP, Paul Loge and Franklin Urbas, who've recently been uh, awarded uh, accolades from, from the ITSMA for their work. And, and what they have done is to arm the sales team uh, with, with data that helps the sales team make decisions about uh, who's the most active uh, clients uh, or prospects across all the various different types of data. And, and what Paul and team have done is to uh, leverage that data for activation purposes. So imagine you've got um, the, the, the programmatic channels, which in my opinion is a relatively new entrant into the B2B space uh, in terms of you know, the demand gen functions using the programmatic channels to engage their customers. That technology really isn't very strong in the B2B space. So that's back to the idea of being really, really creative uh, with the data. Um, so the, the team at uh, SAP did some really powerful things with Adobe and the Adobe Audience Manager, mm -hmm. which is really a B2C tool. It's a cookie-based tool, but they did some amazing work and, and it was really fun to collaborate them, uh, collaborate with them based on the tools we had built at the Big Willow as well. And, and I say built because the, the market demands required us to build a B2B DMP to complement the techniques of the B2C DMPs that are out there that are very much cookie-based. We added in some extra layers of technology that, that helped us to do more of the account-based identification and then with devices and cookies target people inside of those accounts. So you see what I mean of putting that IP wrapper around the cookie data, which helped us do a much more B2B play. Got so uh, I, I, I say that because, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a thing that is so deep down under the covers that most people aren't really talking about it. A lot of vendors don't do that. Um, and I think that's one way that you can start to activate in really creative uh, ways. So, so activation, you know, really is doing surround sound with the people uh, based on the cookies, the device identifiers, the IP addresses, the email addresses, and the phone. If you can tie that all together and orchestrate that, uh, you've really got a modern B2B uh, approach to using data to get into the channels, to connect with people, to create those opportunities uh, for sales that we want to qualify and, and open up and, and work. Awesome. Cool. So I, I know we are, we are getting close to the time. So moving on, the final question that I have for both of you guys before we take any questions from the audience, question for Derek. Derek, in your experience working with other B2B enterprise companies, if you had to say one area or one aspect that they are not used leveraging data smartly enough uh, consistently in your experience, where would that be that they can do a better job? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it signals an intent, um, you know, to be honest with you, uh, you know, the, there's been a commoditization inside the data space, right? Like the zoom info discover org, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, consolidation of the world, you know, eat, eat, eating out the world's data vendors has, has, you know, definitely created, um, 
you know, cheap accessible data on from a contact standpoint, yep. right? And yep. and LinkedIn, you know, and some of the other resources out there, again, you know, like you know, it, yep. that's had a greater propensity and a greater availability than any time in, in human history, right? Yes. So, you know, I think that, you know, that information has just become just, you know, table stakes. Like you sure. just it's it's secondary, you don't even think about it because it's yep. just such a fundamental yep. piece. Yep. Um, you know, the the real opportunity for people is in intent data and and that's that's obviously a very broad category right because we can talk about like you know the stuff that's going on inside of content distribution networks we can talk about stuff that's going on from reverse ip lookup we can talk about the stuff that that neil has you know helped to build and, and engineer at big willow and and all these other and and things that you do right and that the the signals and and that data that is so relevant so i think that you know Again, it's this strategy that Neil talked about. It's laying down and sitting down with that metrics and saying like, hey, what do we want to know about a customer? What do we have today? What can we borrow? What do we need to buy? And what is, it, it creates relevancy, right? Because of the amount of information, you know, an intent layer data point needs to be backed with a content strategy. Yeah. It needs to be backed with the playbook and a talk track. It needs to be backed with, um, a, a customer success and 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 actual like uh, implementation right piece as well where like how you know how that need and how their interactions of the things that are going on inside their business happen to imp imply or impact the rollout of the solution right and so i think that you know uh intent data you know has been kind of seen as this like oh it's just like nice to have over here and it's kind of relevant and one of the reasons that that's been also is that like a lot of the actionability of the data hasn't been there. The way that, you know, information has been uh, kind of pushed to sales reps, it hasn't been necessarily transparent about where it came from, why it was sorted, what was behind it, the technology piece. And salespeople are a-holes. I, I, I am a salesperson, so I can say this. Um, you know, like we don't, uh, accept your word for anything. We want to. We want to hear it ourselves. We we will seeing is believing to a salesperson. And so, if the explanation of where data came from and its impact and how to actually use it isn't there, it's just a, it's just a cold name. It's just another list. It's just more garbage that's thrown over from marketing to the sales side of the business. And so, again, the way that you present that data to to a person who's activating those mm -hmm. customers, the way that you help build the collateral and and the actual messaging is so critical. And it also creates the trust, right? Because that's the other piece here on intent data. It's like, well, where are you getting this from? And and you know how mm -hmm. factual is? And and they need to understand there's a certain level of uh, direct type of line of sight stuff. And there's a certain amount of directional, Hey, yep. this is what's going on in the business. And yep. here's how you use that piece of information yep. Yep. in order to actually create a compelling uh, opening uh, value proposition and story as you're actually trying to get that customer to, to close one. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I know that that was a long way of kind of talking about what the data is that people could be using better, but I think that like, there's still a big gap here in between yeah. the data that's available out there and how it's actually operationalized and, and put into play. Yeah. And, and that's why more companies are not uh, buying into or, seeing the 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 impact of uh intent data immediately because they're missing this kind of operationalized piece and all the support that goes into actually making the data usable i 100 percent agree with that and one of the things challenges we see ourselves with our clients is one of the big problems is is not the data itself it's but the operationalizing of it sales yeah. doesn't really always believe this data it's not an inbound lead it's not a cold lead you just told me these companies were doing something. They were talking to these vendors or these things were happening. What do I do with it? How do I do with it? I think there is a big gap. I 100% agree with that uh, specifically. Neil, uh, from your side, anything to add to that? Well, gosh, I mean, it's hard to top Derek and his, his operational expertise and, and being you know, so deep in it with so many clients every single day. So it's, it's a high bar to get over. Uh, what I would add is uh, more related to the process of how clients test intent data in a rigorous and, and scientific even yeah. uh, process. 
having been an intent data vendor uh, in, in my past, um, I have had the experience of, of being involved in a number of buying cycles with really, really big companies. And I didn't see a lot of rigor. I saw politics rather than actual true objective fact on does this vendor enable us to select the right accounts that we're looking for in the markets we're going after, activate the data through channels to connect with those people. It sounds simple, but that process doesn't happen. Oh, I like vendor XYZ because I used them at the last company. Well, if we're in different markets or different geos or it's a different economic cycle, the, that vendor may or may not be able to service you in your current capacity. So what I like to see is uh, more rigor around the bake-offs, uh, comparing uh, you, th there was a really great article that's still out there where um, Merit Direct, a vendor, uh, compared Six Sense, uh, the Big Willow, and Bombora data together all at once. Um, and uh, that was the first time that I actually saw that process even attempted. And my lessons from that were, you know, when you give all the same vendors, all the same accounts, and turn them loose to drive results, you can see some really interesting distinctions in terms of which are the capabilities that a vendor can bring to the table for you with their respective strengths. You may want all of them. That's what Don and the team at, at Commvault, after years of pioneering with intent, came to the conclusion that it's really a multi-vendor uh, approach that you want to take on. And better yet, get them operating together, which is almost unheard of. But you know, it can happen. And that's part of that creativity that I think is really called for, uh, for those expert marketers inside of the big companies or small companies that are trying to put this stuff to work. I think vendors are willing to do things uh, when asked. And I think that's a really fun part of the process to be running plays around uh, right now. Getting some comparative insight uh, in, a, in a relatively scientific manner as best we can. Amazing. This is great. Um, I'll, I'll see if any questions from the audience. I know there's a few people still around. Anyone from the audience wants to ask any specific questions for Derek and Neil um, around intent, data, how it's used, uh, unique data points, anything, feel free to uh, post it in the chat window. If there are no questions, I do have one question for Neil and, and that was, a, and maybe Derek too, is there's definitely a challenge in operationalizing data. But the last point that you mentioned, Neil, was there is still, I mean, the, the, for the Zoom infos of the world, measuring their accuracy is pretty simple. I sent an email that the email bounce. If it didn't bounce, it's good. I call them, did they pick up? It's a direct dial, is, is it valid? If it, it's good, that's just a very binary type thing. But anytime when you're using some kind of a sophisticated data, like whether it's first party, second party, third party intent, things like that. I have never seen anyone or not enough people saying, how do you validate your intent signals are working? The best way is, well, I talked to my customers and some of them gave me case studies, uh, so, which is sort of ad hoc. Um, and, and I think there has to be a merit. That's, that needs to be stringent upon. The industry needs to push around that. So do you see, like, who would organize this kind of a data validation? Is it the vendors who themselves would come up with their own validation? Or would it be a third party, like a forester or serious decisions? Who should do it? You know, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, you know, there, there's always the fox in the hen house kind of situation. So I don't really think it's, 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 I think the vendors can be amenable to the process, but I, you know, I don't think anybody would, 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 uh, if one vendor organized a big thing, you know, which we actually tried to do at the Big Willow, uh, and that didn't work very well because who wants to really be exposed, you know, in, in what may, might be a political situation. So I, I'd say, you know, there certainly is a huge opportunity for the analysts to do, uh, you know, work to help their, their customers. Uh, I would argue, though, that, you know, commonly uh, the analyst companies uh, their own operations actually uh, are parallel with most of their enterprise customers in terms of the common challenges that they face as well. Um, so they sort of they sort of sit in an interesting space. Um, I, I think that we end up doing it, uh, you know, as as an enterprise customer. It's really up to that team 
to uh, create the rigor around their buying process that would um, you know, enable them to know what they're trying to do in terms of their go-to-market and then uh, organize the, the processes that are supported by the data that are gonna help achieve those strategic goals. That's what I meant early on when I was saying like, you know, how important the data strategy can be yeah. at the executive level. It's really connecting those dots. And, and I wanna give credit to my good friend, John Russo at, at B2B Fusion, who talked about the challenge of, of all of this Star Trek language uh, that we've introduced into marketing and selling. Uh, you know, I can remember when, when nobody knew of our MQL at Serious Decisions and, and, and Derek said it earlier, I feel really proud to know, you know that that's a term people know, but you say that to CXOs or your board, I mean, they tune out, that's, that's the Star Trek language. We gotta talk to them about business results uh, and uh, you know, business results uh, in a scientific manner that are supportable uh, on a relative basis, right? Because we're never gonna know the absolute truth of whether this data was perfect. But we do know on a relative scale, hey, uh, how successful have, be, have we been as we've, as, we, as we've charged out into the marketplace uh, in this geography uh, with the same reps and the same you know, horsepower? Uh, that's where data can start to show the impact that it's having, data quality uh, inside the company and uh, the data quality of the, the external vendors that, that, that we're employing. Awesome. Oh, this is great. Thank you so much, both of you guys. I think this was, for me personally, it was super insightful and I'm, I'm sure it's, it's useful for the attendees. We're, it's being recorded, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll edit the recording after it's done, do some pre-processing and share with everyone. And again, thank you so much, both of you guys. I, I thank you for your time and your insights and uh, talk to you soon. I, I do have to cancel the meeting, so we'll, we'll drop off. But Thank you very much, both of you guys. Have a great day. Yeah, pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Thanks. This is fun. Bye, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Bye -bye. Absolutely. Take care. See you, everyone.